any of you feel comfortable in reading that SOIL report and making recommendations. So you can uh, do it for yourself in the future. It's not very complicated. Um, I think it's an important piece of the puzzle and it's valuable to take ownership of that process and be able to actively engage over the years um, in the modulations that occur. Um, the first slide there uh, has the, um, the target levels for macronutrients, and the second slide says target levels for, for trace elements or micronutrients. Um, those, when you are asking yourself, well, how much copper am I supposed to have? Those are the slides to go back to. So you can circle it, and you can write something else besides target levels that speaks to you. But when you ask yourself that question, that's where you should go back to. Um, those are you know, ranges, they're ballparks. We're not being anal and totally linear. Um, it's just sort of a relative, relative range to be aiming towards. And always a little bit less than full is the target. You, know, you don't want to try to just get exactly there or a little bit extra. Like a little bit less than full is just fine. Um, <clears throat> the, um, there's a couple caveats. Um, the first two bullet points there say uh, a base plus or agrodyne 2 test, and it's a strong acid test. Um, there are as many um, types of soil tests as there are um, dialects of German. You know, I mean, every single lab basically is going to give you a different result on the same soil test. So, um, this soil test that I'm going to train you in reading and understanding um, and working with is one that was developed by a guy named. Um, Dr. William Albrecht, whose a few of his books are laying around here on the sides. Um, Dr. William Albrecht is the formal agronomy USDA land grant university scientist that I hide behind. Um, and people give me a hard time about my science, so let me tell you this story and then you can <laughs> have a story to hide behind too if you want. Um, um, anybody ever been in that position where you get confronted with logical people wanting your science? I'm like, I don't know, it's just right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> uh, William Albrecht was a farm boy, which I think is always a good uh, place to start on <laughs> the farm, um, boy or girl. He uh, was from Illinois. He did his graduate level research um, in the 20s on World War I draft records and the overlay between acceptance rates of draftees and soil types. He saw, county by county, increases and decreases in acceptance rates of uh, draftees that correlated with soil type. That there was a higher level of acceptance um, from boys that grew up in Illinois and Iowa um, in the breadbasket and the appetite plain states. And there's a lower level of acceptance in Appalachia. Um, you have the archetype in your mind of the big broad, strong Midwestern farm boy and the um, buck tooth, you know, flat-footed <laughs> Appalachian hillbilly. Got those in your head? Not to be, here we are in Appalachia. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Appalachia too. <laughs> um, in World War I, the, uh, you were accepted for the draft if you had good teeth and good arches. If you could march for 20 miles, and you could eat hardtack, then you were fit to be, you know, trench warfare, you know, machine gun fodder. Um, because in the Civil War, they had to march and eat hardtack, and that was the standard. Same way they judged a horse. If it's got good teeth and good feet, it's probably a good horse. If it's got bad teeth or bad feet, not worth buying. So much higher levels of rejection in, Ap in boys that grew up in Appalachia. And we have the German immigrants coming from, you know, Germany, obviously, going to Minnesota and uh, Wisconsin, and also going to the Ozarks. And it wasn't about the genetics, the bloodlines, it was about where those bloodlines grew up, what they ate. And, and Albrecht thought that was really, really interesting. And um, he proceeded to do 30 years of research, testing different soils, different minerals and soils, growing different crops, watching how the crops grew, um, you know, yields, pest pressure, disease pressure, and then feeding those crops to animals in multiple generations. So he would take a soil, uh, like a clay, and put it through a centrifuge and spin out all of the attached potassium and calcium and magnesium. 
and then add certain ratios to this clay, like you know, 55% calcium and 15% magnesium and 5% potassium here, and 75% calcium and 12% magnesium and you know, 3% potassium there. And he would plant the same corn seeds and grow them, and then take that corn and feed it to rabbits, and watch how they grew through multiple generations. Did they increase in size? Did they have larger litters? Did they have longer health lifespans? Did they shrink in size? Did they have issues with fertility? And he was able to get these same results that were, you know, he noticed in the draft records by modulating mineral levels in soils and growing crops and feeding it out to animals. More than 500 published papers, um, you know, peer-reviewed. He was the head of the um, soil department at the University of Missouri for 20 years. I'm not sure what it's called at UVM, but in Massachusetts, at UMass, it's called the Plant and Soil Science Department. So, in Missouri, in the 30s, it was called the Soil Department. He was the head. He ran the Soil Department at the Land Grant University for 20 years. This is USDA research, hundreds of published papers. Um, this science, which was being well developed, and he had students, and they were doing work all across the country, um, was basically squelched after World War II when the armaments industry had a surface of production capacity with a deficit of market. They had the capacity to produce a whole bunch of explosives and lots of nice chemical weapons, but no market for them. And they said, where can we sell this stuff to? And so they said, <laughs> farmers. <laughs> um, and so they started funding research to you know, prove the value of these soluble nitrogen fertilizers and soluble phosphorus fertilizers. Remember the uh, Oklahoma City bombing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fertilizer bomb? Mm -hmm. All a fertilizer bomb is, is the two components of explosives that were two separate fertilizers that if you put together, turn into an explosive. Because that's all they ever were since the beginning of the industry, because that's where they came from, was the production lines of munitions. Um, and the chemical weapons, um, Nerve gas is, <laughs> there's your herbicides, there's your fungicides, there's your pesticides. So uh, money was applied to the uh, land grant system starting in the 40s, uh, most strongly in the 50s, um, and a lot of this knowledge and information has been lost, but it's not that's not there in literature. Um, this is well-founded, lots of good science behind this. So um, what Albrecht basically found was, when you get these basic mineral levels and ratios present in the soil, Life does better. Um, you can have deficiencies where you don't have enough of this or enough of that, and that inhibits life. There's a, a principle called Liebig's Barrel. Anybody heard of Justus von Liebig? Anybody who studied agronomy? Most of you haven't been polluted <laughs> by the study of agronomy. How do you spell that? Uh, Liebig, I think it's L E I B I G. It could be L I E. Would you know? L I E. L I E? Oh, that's a good spelling. L-I-E-B-I-G, Liebig. Uh, Liebig's barrel is, I believe this is like a, pretty much of an agronomy 101 kind of um, piece. Take a whiskey barrel, you know, a wine barrel. It's, these days people cut them in half and use them for planters. See one of those? This is your barrel right here. These are the staves. So in Liebig's barrel, each stave is represented by an element, calcium, magnesium, uh, sulfur, boron, potassium, etc. So when you get your soil test back, you can see my calcium level is at 85% of where it should be. And my magnesium level is at 90%. And my sulfur level is at 15%, and my boron level is at 10%, and my potassium level is at 75%. So the principle of Liebig's barrel is basically that the barrel can hold as much water as the shortest stave um. is long. Mm -hmm. And that is your yield potential. So the genetic potential of the plant is X, and the environmental conditions determine how much of that potential can be realized as you know as, as, as a crop. Um, in the um, specific of corn, which I think has been well studied in this country, most people all probably know that. Um, if you go to the geneticists, the corn geneticists at, Port, at Purdue or Iowa State, they'll tell you that all of the um, 
seeds, the corn seeds that are the hybrids and things that are sold conventionally right now have a yield potential between 1,000 and 1,200 bushels per acre. That's it. That's the range of all the corn on the market right now, between 1,000 and 1,200 bushels per acre. If you go to the USDA and ask what the average yield has been for the past 10 years, they'll tell you it's between 140 to 160 bushels per acre, which is what? 10-15% of the yield potential. And that's better than most people who have grown tomatoes. They're probably getting 5% of yield potential. Um, we are realizing as farmers a embarrassingly poor yield because we have so many systemic shortcomings um, in our management practices. And so I'm going to walk through these all in this manner, but this is the idea, the way to look at these things. Um, if any one of these things is really dramatically deficient, it doesn't matter about the rest of them. Right? You do everything else well, but the soil is dry as a bone. I did my soil testing, I've been doing my foliar sprays, I inoculated the seed, <laughs> and you're growing in a sand dune. What can I tell you? I mean, <laughs> where does common sense come in? Um, so the, the, the concept here basically um, is with soil testing is you want to identify the minerals that are at, at the greatest level of deficiency and begin to address them and build them up systemically. Um, based on your acreage, based on your budget, based on logistics, you can work on all of them in any given year or you can work on one or maybe two. Um, and I generally suggest it's a good you know, two or three year process to begin to fill the tank of some of these things that are really dramatically deficient. Um, so, um, but what's exciting is that because most of us are realizing something like a 5 or 10% yield on what's possible, when you get a 50% increase in yield, you're only still getting a 15% of what you could get. Right? And you get a 50% increase on that, and you're still only getting 22% of what you could get. Um, I went to college and didn't really want to, but didn't want to go to school anyways. Um, I asked my uncle when I was, I think it was the end of my sophomore year, um, I said, Uncle Dick, if you had to go to college again, what is the thing that you would take now that you didn't take before? What is like the thing you wish you knew more about? And he said, organic chemistry. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, I'll take organic chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I think my final exam grade was like a 37. Um, and, you know, my <laughs> midterm was like a 45, so I was not anywhere close to passing. But I got a D um, because the professor graded on the curve. Right? And I think that's basically where we're at as farmers. Um, we are all such abject failures um, that we're being graded on the curve. Um, but there's such a massive amount of opportunity, of improvement, that you don't have to do anything even halfway well. Right? To be blowing your mind as far as what it results. I mean, it's, this, is what, this is what excites me, is I can just do a what I know is a half-assed job, and people are like, oh my god, Andy, this stuff looks great. I'm like, ha I know. <laughs> Sad, isn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, so it's, it's really exciting to me, um, these things. But um, So the conversation between now and lunchtime is soil testing and mineral balancing. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a quick background on Albrecht. Understand that the recommendation that I'm going to be teaching you how to make is coming from an Albrecht-style soil test which means you can't go to UVM, you can't go to UMass, you can't go to a bunch of other places and take one of their reports right. and apply what I'm about to teach you. Because it's a different language. Um, just to give you a quick example about that, which will hopefully drive this point home and prevent this mistake from happening. Um, um, we did this experiment a couple years ago with a farm on, uh, down by Cape Cod where we took a sample of soil and we split it and we sent one half to Logan Lab, which is an Albrecht style lab, and one half to UMass. And they both claimed to do an, uh, what's called a Malik 3 extraction for phosphorus. Um, Malik 3 is a certain intensity of acid, and you know, it's an established protocol. And both UMass and Logan followed the same, same exact protocol. When we got the reports back, Logan said 150 parts per million phosphorus, and UMass said 6 parts per million phosphorus. And so we were like, I mean, you know, 10, 20%, 30% difference, like maybe experimental error, but I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a big difference, 2,000%, um, 2,500% difference, like what's going on here? And so we started calling up like, you know, 
we know they're different, but like how can they be this different? Um, what UMass assumes is that 95% of the phosphorus in the soil is insoluble because phosphorus ties up and therefore is unavailable for your crop. And they only tell you about the 5% of the phosphorus that's in your soil. Um, there's this, I think I talked about it, mycorrhizal fungi? Mycorrhizal fungi are really, really good at solubilizing, digesting phosphorus and feeding it to a plant. So if you're in a chemical system where you're applying tillage and you're applying sides of various sorts and chemical fertilizers, soluble phosphorus fertilizers, it's totally true that 95% of that phosphorus in your soil is unavailable for your plant. But if you've got a biological ecosystem where you've got an established fungal community, all 150 of those parts per million are available reasonably for your plant to use. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you do not necessarily need to add phosphorus if you've got 150 parts per million phosphorus. What you need to do is make sure if you've got phosphorus deficiencies that you're doing a good job managing the fungi. You don't need to add more stuff. You need to understand why it's not necessarily available. Does that make sense? And Logan just tells you, you've got 150 parts per million. We're not saying whether it's available or not. UMass tells you, you've only got five, five or ten parts per million, six parts per million in this case, available. Um, but that's the sort of, that's something you don't understand when you look at the UMass or UVM soil test or the, you know, Albrecht style soil test. So, as an example, as, or maybe that will stick in your minds. Um, there's a few labs around the country that do do an Albrecht style uh, test. Um, Logan Lab is one, and I recommend them because we can get a bunch of other elements like cobalt and molybdenum and selenium and stuff like that, basically for free, where they would cost an extra of 30 or 40 or 50 dollars in other labs. That's the only reason I'm recommending them. But um, Midwest Lab is good, um, a &L Lab is good, uh, Logan Lab, those are, those are three good uh, Albrecht style labs in this country um, that you can you should be able to read their reports and make recommendations from as an adopt Is that all somewhat clear? Okay. Um, so before we get into the minerals, um, there's a few uh, lines on the soil test report that's good to go over and just sort of review so we're all the same, speaking the same language. Um, I think third or fourth line down it says uh, soil sample depth six inches. People see that on the soil test report itself. Um, so, for those who have never taken a soil test, um, the process is to get a core, as in the same amount from the top inch, and the second inch, and the third inch, and the fourth inch, of all the top six inches. You want a core, not, not a V-shape, right? You want a straight cylinder shape um, from multiple locations around the area that you're sampling, like five or six locations at least is good. Um, and you take those samples, and you mix them up in a bucket, and you basically take a pound of that soil out and put it in a bag, fill out your form and send it in. It costs 30 bucks at Logan to get all those elements. Um, but the idea is that basically the top six inches are the aerobic zone, and so that's the only area where there's air, and therefore the only area where there's high level of life and where all the feeder roots are and where all the, but the plants are basically getting the majority of their nutrition from. So we want to read that to see roughly what's available uh, for the plants in the environment. Um, Okay, so that's the sample depth. Um, <clears throat> exchange capacity is a topic that some people may or may not be familiar with. I think it's probably worth just quickly going into it. Um, the idea with exchange capacity is people may have heard about the sand, silt, um, clay sort of concept. You've got sand here, you've got silt <coughs> here, and you've got clay here. So conceptually, the same relative amount of space, you have much more surface area here than you have here. Does that make sense? And the surface area is where the bonding actually is going on of the nutrients that are being taken up by the plant. So you'll have a little couple of electrons, you know, sticking out here conceptually and attached to a calcium. There's a magnesium here, and there's a little bit of a, there's a copper over here, um, etc. And then, so with that, with the silt, you have potentially many more nutrients attached to the soil, and with the clay, even many, many more nutrients attached to the soil. So the exchange capacity is functionally how many of these bonding sites do you have in a unit of your soil. And the more bonding sites, the higher the exchange capacity, which means the bigger the functional tank is of your soil, the more nutrients it can hold, and the more production capacity it has. 
Does that make sense? Roughly? A sandy soil is like a, you know, a motorcycle gas tank. Gallon and a half, two gallons. A clayey soil with high organic matter is like a big pickup truck. F three hundred and fifty gas tank, right? The how full the tank is is a different conversation, but the size of the tank is what your exchange capacity is telling you, and that correlates with your yield capacity. The heavier your soil, the more exchange capacity, the more yield potential your soil has. So it's not really necessarily that important because you can't do a hell of a lot about it. Um, the only thing you can really do is you can increase organic matter. But organic matter has this, of course, very fractal structure and potential to hold many more nutrients per unit space than the clay does. So the more organic matter you've got, the more structure you've got, the higher your exchange capacity is, the more food you've got for your soil life. So people will generally have a positive connotation about organic matter and think more is better. I would agree with that. Um, that's all you can really do about it, but you know, this is just sort of a conceptual framework to work from. Um, is that relatively clear? Mm -hmm. Can you have too much organic Quiet. matter? Um, can you have too much organic matter? Um, I think you can spend too much time, I mean, the only way to get generally more than 10 or 12 percent organic matter is to be putting a ton of compost down, which is generally means you're doing a lot of work. Right. Um, I think anywhere between 5 and 8 percent is probably pretty good. Um, and uh, generally people who have very high organic matter levels have been putting more of their energy into that than they have been into other things. Right. Um, so that's not their issue anymore. You know, a deficiency of organic matter is not a problem. A deficiency of cobalt or something is probably your problem. Right. So I would say you should reprioritize your efforts. Yeah. Is there like a range for the total exchange capacity? Yes. Okay. Um, generally, eight to twelve is considered to be normal. Okay. So, for whatever that means, um, five is like a sand dune. Four or five is a sand dune. Um, you know, eighteen or twenty is nice, heavy clay with lots of organic matter. Um, I mean, you'll have a hard time finding 18 or 20 around here. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, next one is pH. A lot of people have been convinced that pH is very important. Um, people who have been told about agronomy, I am of the opinion that pH is a uh, tangential factor, and if you apply good management practices, you can basically ignore it. Um, but I'd like to discuss pH because it's definitely in a lot of people's minds. Um, so. Let's just, let's just you know, address it directly. Um, <clears throat> does anybody know what pH is actually monitoring? Hydrogen, right? Hydrogen. Parts per hydrogen. Something about hydrogen. Yes. Something about hydrogen ions. Um, have you seen this picture before? Sure, water. Seen that one? All right, so generally, this is a concept. Water has one... Um, molecule of water is a concept. Rarely do you find just one molecule of water. Generally you find a whole bunch of molecules of water in relationship with each other. And um, so, and water is, is called dipolar, which means it's, it's got a, a rough, it's got a charge. And, it, and this H and this OH aren't always, you know, intimately attached. It's a much more uh, loose relationship than this bonding picture makes it out to be. So um, what you will have is you'll have um, a lot of other H's and O's and H's that are sort of freely floating around. And these guys might get together every now and then. Um, and then you've got another H and O and H over here. Um, and these guys get together every now and then. Um, and it's, this, it's a much more um, of a crystalline lattice vibratory matrix than this sort of fixed HOH concept that we have. Um, that's part of it. And the other part of it is, rarely, if ever, do you find exactly the same amount of H's and OH's. And so my understanding of what pH is telling you is relatively how many H's there are to OH's in this one. So P to 7 means there's one H for every one OH. That really occurs. P to 6 means there's 10 H's for every one OH. This is a logarithmic scale. So 6.9 
means there's 10 times as many, sorry, there's twice as many H's as there are OH's, right? So it's a logarithmic scale. So it gets more and more intense. Uh, H of 5 means there's 100 H's for every one OH. Uh, H of 8 means there's one H for every 10 OH's. Um, concept? Got it? Not too complicated? Where is calcium in this picture? Present. I don't see calcium here anywhere. I was a little bit, yes, oh. rhetorical question. Obviously, there's no calcium in this picture. Um, and yet we're all told to correlate pH with applications of limestone, right? True. Why? Anybody have a guess? Does it bring the pH up? It does bring the pH up. So therefore, what does it actually do? How does it bring the pH up? What would have to happen? Oh, it makes it wetter. The breaking the bond between the OHs? Um, their, yeah. it, it binds to uh, the OHs. What happens here in the soil is sometimes you've got, you've got these bonding sites, right? Um, and here it's attached to a calcium, here it's attached to a magnesium, here it's attached to a copper. Um, when the plant, or the soil life, usually, goes down, injects a little acid to s remove the copper from the soil, it doesn't just leave that electron hanging free, it replaces the copper with a hydrogen. And so a low pH soil is one that has a bunch of hydrogens. Which basically means your tank is empty. Right? There's no calcium, there's no potassium, there's no phosphorus, mm. there's, there's not many of those things because there's a bunch of hydrogens. You've got an imbalance, you've got too many hydrogens in the environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not too complicated, really? Mm. Um, so, if you add limestone, what the calcium will do is it'll kick hydrogens off and attach to the soil. And by kicking the hydrogens off and attaching to the soil, it functionally removes the high level of hydrogens which functionally raises the pH. Yeah? So why is that considered to be important? Why do people think pH is important? So nutrients can be taken up by plant and it's too acidic, so nutrients don't get taken up. That's the argument, exactly. So, um, I'm using orange too much. Different color. Um, call this a test tube with a piece of copper in it. Test tube full of water with a piece of copper in it. Everybody see that? Um, and we're going to call this a pH scale. So we'll start at 5 and 5.5 and 6 and 6.5 and 7 and 7.5. Um, in this test tube, this copper will become more or less soluble based on the pH of the water. This is the principality, it's called, it's called solubility in solution. Solubility gradient, solubility index. And functionally what happens is that the copper is most soluble in this range. Anybody seen this picture in a book ever? Imagine this picture, something close to it. Um, so the solubility gradient says that Copper and also interestingly zinc and also interestingly magnesium and also interestingly potassium are more soluble in a test tube when the pH is between 6.4 and 6.8 than it is in most other environments. This is true in a test tube. I argue there's one thing missing that's present in the soil that's not present in the test tube. We actually have things. But one really important thing is there's no life in this test tube. Right. This is an abiotic. Um, you know, sort of, <laughs> it's a dead chemical system. This is not life, this is chemistry. So that principle of solubility in solutions is true in chemistry, and it's actually true that that is how the soil life do solubilize the copper or solubilize the phosphorus. Not all elements are most soluble in this range, right? Things like phosphorus are not soluble in this range. Certain elements 
the plants will, just, will we have a hard time picking up are not soluble in this range. But what the soil life do, what they're really, really good at, is exuding acids and bases to raise and lower pH to solubilize the nutrients that they want when they want it. And so what happens in a living system is the pH goes up and down all